Great. That should be everyone. So go ahead and get started here. Thank you. Hello. And welcome to this uh, webinar from the Centre on Constitutional Change Between Independence and Union, an Alternative for Scotland. I'm Muir Dickey and I'm the Scotland correspondent, correspondent excuse me, for the Financial Times and delighted to be part of this attempt to investigate uh, an important element of the constitutional debate, both in Scotland and across the UK. In Scotland, certainly, that debate recently has been very much polarised between the question of whether to remain in the UK or whether to leave and become an independent state. But now, today we'll be looking at the possibilities for a third option, a middle way perhaps, some form of reform settlement in which proponents hope Scotland as well perhaps as Wales and Northern Ireland could sit more comfortably while remaining part of the United Kingdom. So what are these options? Um, how can the United Kingdom be changed to work in a way that might give uh, the freedom of action that devolved nations require, but still be an effective unitary state. Uh, today, to help us tackle this, these questions, I have uh, three distinguished speakers. Sarah Boyack is a Scottish Labour member of the Scottish Parliament. She served uh, where she served between 2011 and 2016 and returned to in 2019. She currently is the Scottish Labour Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Constitution external affairs and culture. Lord Stephen Green is a, or was a Conservative Minister for the State uh, and Trade Investment in the UK government. He's also a former group chairman for HSBC Holdings. He recently co-authored a book, Unwritten Rule, How to Fix the British Constitution. And last but not least, Nicola McEwen is Professor of Territorial Politics at the University of Edinburgh and co-director of the Centre of Constitutional Change. So I'm going to ask each of our speakers to talk for about five minutes, and then we will open up to questions from our audience. Uh, Sarah, could you start us off? Excellent. Uh, well, look, it's great to join this conversation today. Um, and to that question, is there space between independence and unionism? I would say yes, and that it's vital that there is. Um, my view is that it's called devolution or home rule, and it's vital that we do the hard work in reflecting on how what could be called the status quo needs to be developed and improved upon. Um, many of us believe that devolution is a process, not an event, and I believe that our aim has to be to focus on how we use the powers of our parliament to deliver the social, economic and environmental justice that our voters need. So the paper that's been drafted by Stephen Green and his colleagues, I think is very timely, given the debates and discussions we've been having over the last weeks and months about how we think about how the government of Scotland should continue to develop and change to deliver on people's aspirations and what needs we change across the rest of the UK to live up to the aspirations we had when the Scottish Parliament was established just over 20 years ago. Now, at the moment, I think our collective priority has got to be recovering and rebuilding after COVID. Um, and, and I would observe that when it suits everyone in power, we're tackling the pandemic as part of a four nations approach. When it doesn't suit the key players, it's about how others are letting us down. And I think that's a deflection. It's not good enough. And moreover, the impact of Brexit on our constitutional framework is huge, including the need to approach certain key policy areas on a common UK basis. And it will be key in delivering a successful recovery for both the UK and the Scottish governments to start to build a stronger, more productive relationship to make that possible. And I think that will require much more robust UK governance structures and accountability across the UK and within the UK and within the four nations. And I was only recently appointed to my role of shadowing the SNP's cabinet member uh, for the Constitution, External Affairs and Culture after the election. Um, I was delighted because those issues are critical to how we recover from the pandemic, how we rebuild and um, build our relationships with key neighbours, not just in the UK, but in Europe as we rebuild after the pandemic. Um, and I think it's worth saying that at our first meeting last week of our new committee, that's at the Parliament's committee, that's looking at the Constitution, External Affairs, Europe and Culture, there was a degree of cross-party agreement that you probably wouldn't expect. Um, the, the need to focus on holding the Scottish Government to account on external affairs and international development, but also agreement on the need for us to promote and sustain our work 
with parliamentarians across the UK and think about how we retain relations with EU parliamentarians as well. So I think we face some key challenges, um, one of which is how do we improve the effectiveness of the Scottish Parliament in holding the Scottish Government to account? We've got 25 cabinet members and ministers. What changes do we need in the Scottish Parliament? I think there's some unfinished business from the last presiding officer, Ken McIntosh, um, with the review he convened on how we need to change how the Scottish Parliament operates to make it more effective. Um, in, our, in our Labour manifesto for the elections this year in Scotland, we set out areas where we believe power should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament based on our commitment to a more powerful Parliament, able to address the issues that we need to see, see change now for our constituents. Um, so th there are issues there about employment legislation, um, for example, that, that springs to mind. Um, and in the past, we've done work on you know, under the Jack McConnell regime um, to enable um, things to work for Scotland's economy. So I think post-Brexit, there are issues that are worth looking at. Um, we were very supportive of the work done and publicised by the We The People report. It looked at devolving powers from the UK state, not just across four nations, but crucially to the regions in England, to local government right across the UK. Um, and that work's been followed up by the establishment of a constitution commission by Keir Starmer, which looks at some of those issues that are also identified in the unwritten rule, how to fix the UK, particularly looking at aims of breaking down the barriers to democracy and participation. And um, we're reading the um, unwritten rule before I came on uh, to this call. I think one of the issues really powerfully identified is the over-centralized nature of the UK state. Um, and I think that was one of the key problems identified by the We The People report too, identifying the need to devolve powers, not just to the Welsh Assembly and Scottish Parliament, but to local government and power councils and mayors, and to enable them to have the fiscal support from central government, sure, so that we have that sharing of support across our nations, but also to give those councils more fiscal powers and funding too. Um, and I think it's not just an issue for English local government, but for our councils in Scotland too. And it was one of an Ask Sarwar, uh, uh, recently elected Labour leader, it was his challenge to both the SNP and the Conservatives during our recent election campaign that we need to see more powers devolved, for example, to the northeast of Scotland and our highlands to enable them to create the jobs and training opportunities that we need to be seeing driven locally, not a top-down approach. And I think um, coming to the end of my contribution, the issues raised in relation to human rights, which should exist right across the UK, are also interesting because in the last session of the Scottish Parliament, we passed legislation on children's rights um, and local government. And in one of our last debates, it was also clear that there's cross party support for environmental rights, not just in the run up to COP26, but beyond that. So for today, I'm very keen to discuss and hear more about how the UK civil service needs to change particularly in the light of recent abuses of power in relation to um, non-executive directors, which Angela Rayner powerfully articulated recently. Our issue in Scotland may be thinking about looking at how the Scottish government's um, work as civil service works, looking at SPADs, the need for more transparency of issuing government contracts, the need for a more devolved state with more powers and a tax base for local government while retaining local central funding, core funding, Proposals for a reformed UK chamber, something I think which is long overdue. Um, and although the House of Lords has got some talented members, it's not accountable. And as the unwritten authors observe, it's damaged by the nature of the political appointments process. And I think the recommendations on how the civil service operates is particularly interesting given the expertise of the authors. And it's certainly something that Gordon Brown's been articulating in terms of how we make that civil service across the UK talk to each other and not be centralised. So very interested in the, um, the work that's been done also by Nicola McEwen. So I'm looking forward to today's discussion and I'll maybe stop there and let you go on to the next participants. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Stephen, if you'd like to take us on from there. I will do, thank you. And uh, Sarah, thank you for referring so generously to uh, that little book. And uh, it's a little red book. In fact, I could, there you go, little red book.
Um, uh, you could read it in an hour. Um, and I wrote it with a couple of uh, friends of mine who are uh, in both cases, uh, uh, now retired senior experienced public servants, one from, uh, uh, well, I, I got to know Martin Donnelly in the Department of Business as it then was uh, when I was a minister in the coalition government. Uh, and the other Tom Legg, who was a senior law officer. Um, and uh, uh, my own career was bookended by a time in the civil service right at the start and the, my time as minister in the coalition government right at the end. Um, and we uh, have felt increasingly um, that there was something to be said about um, the problems of the British constitution, the constitution of the United Kingdom, um, if it's to be fit for purpose for the rest of this century and, and, and beyond. Um, it, it's famously an unwritten constitution. Um, it, it's not as unwritten as all that, of course, there is, but there are plenty of laws that imply uh, uh, the basis for a constitution. Um, but it is theoretically uh, at the will of the Westminster Parliament and the representation of the People Act, or come to that, if the uh, laws that set up the devolved administrations could all be repealed theoretically by a single vote. Um, in, in the Westminster Parliament. And we do believe that that is now uh, not a satisfactory basis for a stable state going forwards. Um, uh, I, I think the, the, the problems of the British state have, haven't come overnight. They've, they've mounted gradually, probably since the war. Um, problems that manifest themselves in a frankly mediocre performance over the decades of the British state and of the British economy and society. Um, uh, democracy that's weaker than it should be, and I, I, I will come back to that point, um, um, a reform process which has achieved some good things but has stalled um, latterly, um, and lastly an identity crisis which is now quite pervasive, um, it's obviously a, the major topic in, in Scotland, but it's not only Scotland, um, but there are uh, issues about what it is to be British, what it is to be a citizen of the United Kingdom as we look forward, and many of those have been brought into focus by Brexit. Uh, let me just briefly elaborate on all those points, if I may. On the mediocre performance, it, it, it is clear that the British state has got some big things right since the war. Uh, the creation of the welfare state in the late 1940s under, under the Attlee government, and indeed the beginning then of the disengagement largely reasonably done uh, from empire over the following couple of decades. Um, but it's also got some big things wrong. Um, the economy has been a mediocre performer for, for quite a long time. Um, this is one of the most unequal societies amongst any of the rich, uh, the, the developed nations of the world. Um, and then the whole EU experience. I really don't want to dwell on that, um, but the whole business of going into it too late and uh, with a rather limited view of what it should be, um, lukewarm uh, participation in the EU, and then finally, of course, the Brexit decision. Uh, whether you are a Brexiteer or a Remainer, as I passionately am, uh, you can't regard this as anything other than a, a singular failure of the British uh, governing establishment over, over several decades. So there we are. Um, uh, weak democracy, what do I mean by that? I mean by that that although it's produced strong governments, the first past the post system in the Commons um, has uh, never represent, produced governments that have never represented as much as 50% of the voting population. Um, in fact, the only, almost never, because the only government that did represent more than 50% of the votes was in fact the coalition government. Um, although, of course, the voters didn't actually vote for a coalition government. Um, more importantly, and Sarah's already, already referred to this, the, the, the local government has been gradually, has always had weak power, and has gradually been disempowered. And in particular, in the 80s, um, the then Treasury uh, essentially capped rates and, and directed spending and, and, and turned local authorities more or less into agents of the central state. Uh, I am not an expert on Scotland and I can't comment on, on the position in Scotland, but, but certainly uh, this is the heart of what you might describe as the English problem. Um, uh, and then lastly, uh, under this heading, and again Sarah has referred to it, uh, the House of Lords is in need of radical reform and we have got some quite radical things to say about what, what we think should take place. I'll come back to that in a minute if I may. Uh, some things have gone right in terms of reform. Um, if you take a longer term perspective, um, the House of Lords has in fact completely changed its profile from being entirely uh, made up of hereditaries plus Anglican bishops to uh, uh, 
to, to be uh, and law lords to being one in which the the legal uh, system has been taken out of the House of Lords into a separately established Supreme Court. Um, hereditary peer, peers have now other than the 92 uh, that were famously conceded by Tony Blair have now been uh, 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 removed from the House of Lords. And so it is dominated by life peers who are in many ways quite socially, quite socially diverse, although uh, there's more work to be done on that for sure. Um, so it isn't that nothing has changed. And of course, devolution has happened. And devolution, we need to sometimes remind ourselves, is only 20 years old, uh, but it now feels like a, a, an absolutely permanent fixture or feature of the British scene, as so it should be. Um, and there's been some English devolution, starting with the elected mayor of London and now the elected mayors of a number of the metropolitan areas. Um, but I think that the reform seems to have stalled. Um, the House of Lords is clearly unfinished business. Um, uh, the uh, English devolution needs, in our view, to be radically ramped up. Uh, why is it there's only uh, uh, 15 or so English cities with directly elected mayors? Uh, we, we argue that, that all urban areas should have directly elected mayors and that that should go with some tax raising powers and an ability to respond in terms of spending to local needs and be accountable to the electorate for how well all that is done. Um, uh, and then now finally you need, uh, we can hardly ignore the fact that there's an identity crisis and we need to address that um, in order, uh, frankly, to offer Scotland that third alternative that we've been talking about. Um, Northern Ireland is a special case for all sorts of obvious reasons, but the Northern Ireland Protocol has thrown, has exposed the fragility, the continuing fragility of the Northern Ireland situation. And we need to work out what to offer uh, as a positive case for union and not simply say the union as it has been is the, is the only alternative uh, to independence in the case of Scotland. Um, and we argued in our book, firstly, for Devo Max. Um, we can talk in some detail about what Devo Max means, um, and you will have uh, a better feel for some of the specifics of that in a Scottish context than I do. In the case of England, I've already mentioned it, I think we should, uh, we, we've argued for substantial increase in the number of elected mayoralties and make that the backbone of representative local governments in, in, in England. Um, we have some specific things to say about the reform of the way in which public sector management is done. Sarah has alluded to those and, and for, uh, specific proposals for buttressing the independent authority of the legal system. Uh, and then lastly, uh, and just for a minute or two, I want to explain what we think should happen to the House of Lords. Um, the House of Lords ought to be turned into the federal up elected upper house of the union. Um, I, I, elected meaning fully elected. Um, we recommend using the additional member system that you're familiar with in a Scottish context. And we are in London uh, for the elections of the, uh, the, the, uh, for the Great London Assembly. Um, uh, we think that the uh, parliament, that this upper house should have fixed parliamentary electoral cycles and not be uh, subject to the whims that Commons has been, and I think is about again to be, uh, with the power, Prime Minister having the power to dissolve the Commons, um, fixed and longer term cycles um, of, uh, of, a, of a House elected on, an, as I say, a, 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 an additional member system. Um, it should not have power over money bills because we don't think it's a good idea to get into a US style situation where you have two houses competing over money. Um, and so we believe that the Commons should remain uh, the, the ultimate authority on money bills. And that arguably means that the Prime Minister should continue to be a member of the House of Commons and not of the upper house. Um, but importantly, the upper house should have the power of veto, and I mean veto, not simply delay, um, bills that, Im that impact the constitutional settlement, um, which finally we do think should be codified, whether that's in one single written constitution or it's a series of, series of basic laws as the Germans have, for example, um, is, 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 is a debate on an important matter of detail. Um, but the, but the, the point that there should be entrenched laws, which are then uh, subject to pur the purview of not only of the upper house, but of course also of the Supreme Court seems to us to be crucial. 
how are we going to make progress on this? Um, none of the three of us who wrote this book are as, are as naive as to suppose this is going to happen overnight, but we do think there should be a national debate. I personally am encouraged by the um, mandate that Gordon Brown was given by the Labour Party. Uh, I think there should be a widespread public discussion of the way forward on this with a view to getting to a union which is, let's, how can we, I describe it, tolerant, inclusive, fair, uh, internationally open, in other words, the sort of thing that I want my grandchildren to be able to live in uh, for the rest of this century. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you, Stephen. And finally, Nicola, to uh, round out our initial contributions. Thank you, uh, Muir, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I don't think that there is a one-size-fits-all constitutional reform that will resolve all of the issues that uh, dominate our politics in Scotland, certainly, and, and sometimes in other parts of the UK. There's lots of merit in the types of reforms that Stephen and his colleagues have been writing about, that um, the radical federalism, for example, proposals that Sarah was referring to um, have been discussing in terms of reforming the United Kingdom. There were other proposals um, just published yesterday by uh, the Labour government in Wales and um, also have lots of good ideas. There's lots of merit in these things in and of themselves, um, but I don't think they will particularly help to resolve the issue of the governance of Scotland. And that's partly for two reasons. One, federalism in particular is um, a way to balance unity and diversity it's, it, it relies upon a commitment to unity and that's not a commitment that can necessarily be taken for granted right now uh, within scotland perhaps in, in the future if that particular question is addressed at some point um, but also it, it, it it's very difficult to accommodate within a federal structure one of the particular characteristics of the united kingdom as a state and that is its plurinational character so a, a, house, an, a, a reform of the House of Lords turning it into a, a Senate of the Nations and Regions may well be a good thing, uh, but it's very unlikely to give the kind of voice uh, to Scotland as a national community within the UK's political structures that would um, um, leave aside, that, that it convince people to leave aside all of the other issues um, of Scotland's constitutional and territorial future. Now, I think that the UK is profoundly asymmetric in the way that it is structured and the way that its constitution operates. Personally, I think that is a strength. It is a challenge, uh, but I think it's also a strength. But we do have to recognise that reforms in any one part of the United Kingdom may well have a kind of chain reaction effect um, influencing demands um, and attitudes in different parts of the United Kingdom. And I think that is just going to be a feature of the way the UK is governed. And that leads to my second point. We talk um, a lot about the devolution settlement. I use that term uh, too. Um, we talk about resolving the constitutional question. I don't think there is any such thing. I think this is just about the way we live together and manage the relationships between the different parts of uh, these islands under any constitutional uh, set of arrangements. I think it's just something that will be a feature of our politics on an ongoing basis. There isn't um, a, a, a constitutional reform, whether it's Devo Max or whether it's independence, frankly, uh, that will mean that we set aside all issues of constitutional relationships across these islands. And it always strikes me Every time, every time there is a reform to devolution, it always comes with documents that have the title, I think the title that David Cameron used for the last round of devolution reforms was built to last, which always makes me think, well, unlikely, um, because each set of arrangements will have in them the kinds of um, challenges, the, inter <coughs> excuse me, the interdependencies, that will in themselves um, demand a revisit at some point in the future. And I think having the flexibility there, recognising uh, that reforming the arrangements 
in light of changing attitudes or in light, <coughs> excuse me, in light of changing experiences or changing developments in the world is not a problem. It's just part of the way that we govern ourselves. And so trying to draw a line in the sand and get on to thinking about public policy issues and please let God let us leave aside the constitutional issue. I don't think that's very uh, realistic, however much some may will it to be. Um, and the final uh, comment I wanted to make is that, yes, of course, there, is a, there, there are options between independence and this union. There are options within independence and this union. In other words, there is always a spectrum of options. What independence means can be different things with different manifestations of that. What devolution means, what home rule means can um, accommodate different types of arrangements, different sorts of uh, the devolution of powers. And within um, the context of what might be called devolution max, which in itself doesn't really mean anything, it can mean a whole variety of things. Within devolution, there are areas of public policy that uh, it, it might make sense or a case might be made to have further devolution around those issues, areas where there are clear interdependencies between what is currently devolved and what is reserved, where those devolved powers hit at their boundary, where it becomes sometimes problematic, some would argue, um, when it limits and constrains what the parliament can do. Sarah mentioned employment policy, immigration policy would be another obvious one, other aspects of social security not currently devolved. There's a whole host of um, domestic policy spheres that intersect very closely with areas that are uh, currently devolved. And there's lots of debate that we can have on that. Um, I think more neglected within our constitutional conversations has, at least until recently, has been the flip side of, of home rule, and that's the way in which power is shared within the United Kingdom. In academic literature, we talk about shared rule, and that's usually through the intergovernmental arena. How can the devolved institutions have influence within UK government policy making circles when those decisions affect devolved powers? And we saw that very clearly with the Brexit process in particular, we are seeing it now in relation to trade deals, trade agreements, which will have an effect on devolved competences, but because these are areas of reserved power, it's very difficult for the devolved governments to have um, an influence. In other systems, in other countries, there are mechanisms in place to enable that kind of shared power, and we don't really have that um, in any institutionalized sense um, in the UK, and there have been many, many attempts to find ways to do that. There are reviews that have been going on for years to try to come up with uh, those sorts of arrangements, what it fundamentally lacks is the political will uh, to share uh, power. And I think that's um, probably the final point um, I would make for now is that we can talk eloquently and debate all sorts of really interesting issues and propositions around constitutional reform, but fundamentally there has to be the political will um, on all sides uh, to make that happen. And at the moment, uh, within the direction of travel of the current UK administration, there seems to be almost a, a, the opposite of that. There's a, a reluctance to share power. And indeed, the take back control message that was um, motivating and driving um, the relationship with the European Union um, has some aspects of a domestic um, version uh, as well. We've seen that in legislation, for example, most obviously around the UK internal market. And so, yes, there's lots that can be done, but it would require political will on all sides. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Nicola. So now we're going to open up to questions from the audience. Can I encourage anyone who is uh, watching to use the Q&A function on their screen to put questions to our panel members? We have some already. Um, and the one I wanted to start with actually picks up, I think, on the point that Nicola made at the end about political will. It comes from Morag, who's asking, how realistic is it to promote stronger devolution for Scotland 
as a viable way forward when the UK government has introduced legislation that's express, expressly, as she puts it, designed to weaken it in the Internal Markets Act. Now, this is legislation which, among other things, allows uh, the UK government to spend directly in areas of policy that are uh, devolved to the governments of Scotland uh, and, and Wales and has been described by them as, as uh, overruling the devolution settlement. For, for you perhaps to start with Stephen, um, what possible, ev what, what evidence is there of any uh, willingness in the Conservative Party to actually address the over you talk about and to uh, give more powers and controls to devolve settlements? And then after that, perhaps for Sarah, uh, how committed is the Labour Party to making that kind of change uh, a fundamental part of its pitch for the next general election? Um, well, uh, Mira, I'm happy to answer. I, I should perhaps preface anything I say by um, by saying I'm not a member of the Conservative Party, um, and indeed I'm a crossbencher in the House of Lords. Um, I, I, I sat on the government benches during the coalition government and, and for a little while after that, but I am a crossbencher, so I don't speak with authority for the for, for the for the for the Conservative Party. Um, and so what I'm about to say is essentially an observation, and I think that Nicola is right. Um, but there has been a reduction in the instinct to decentralise and to federalise in, in, um, under, under the present uh, government. I think that, that is clear. Um, uh, it, it's, that's, uh, it, if I'm right about that, it's not something I welcome. Um, and and uh, you, you've mentioned the issue about the Internal Market Bill. Um, in, in the end, it became the Internal Market Act, of course, and that's happened. And, it, and, it, it, and one has at least to concede the point that if this is a, a, a single internal market, then, then the rules have to kind of get set uh, essentially for the, for the whole of the market. Um, but but the, the relationship between the uh, UK government and the decentralized uh, the devolved administrations over the passage of the, of the over, over the negotiation and passage of the internal market uh, bill was not the finest hour of the uh, UK government let me say I also think um, and I mentioned this um, but the, the the steam seems to have um, run out of decentralization within England I apologize for mentioning uh, for dwelling on on England in a Scottish context but you've got a huge problem in England because, because, because the sheer size of the place and the historical fact that there is no natural regional subdivision of England um, that you could decentralize power to in the way that you can uh, in the case of Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and potentially, you know, who knows, Cornwall, for example. Um, but in England doesn't have a, a, a history of meaningful regional decentralization. Um, it is also a highly urbanized economy and society, which does actually mean you have to decentralize via mayoralties. Um, and there was good progress being made under that on, on that, both in, uh, well, the, the, the Blair government um, continued through into the coalition government and in the, uh, and actually in the Cameron government up until uh, Brexit. It seems to have run out of steam after that. And I think that's deeply, uh, deeply to be regretted. We, we do need, uh, substantially more, and, and I think I hear you saying this, this is true in Scotland as well, uh, substantially more empowerment of local government, um, both to be democratically accountable in a meaningful way, and I believe that means elected mayors, um, and also to have taxation powers of their own for local purposes. Um, this is work in progress, and the worrying thing is that it does seem to run out of steam, and that there doesn't seem to be a clear philosophical or ideological commitment on, 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 on the part of the present UK government to this. Sarah. Yeah, well, I think, I think it's an issue both across the UK and in Scotland, because um, we are one of the most centralised states in terms of economic decisions. Um, I think that point came across well in the report that you did, Stephen, but other other people have talked about this before. We did a, a really good report last year with the Scottish Fabians, which was looking at future issues of devolution. And that issue about devolving the economy and economic decisions was a big issue. And I, th I think we've seen for a time the city deals is both the UK and the Scottish governments getting involved in making decisions in local areas. And it kind of lets each government put a kind of stamp on what they're doing. But actually it comes from a backdrop of a frozen council tax 
for years. Yeah. No um, change, this is in Scotland, no change in terms of um, support for local authorities to give them more financial flexibility, um, tax varying powers, things like a tourism levy being delayed forever. So I think there's there's issues both in Scotland and the rest of the UK. I think the, the more powers for English mayors has been a game changer in England. Um, and when I think to Scotland, our our regions and local authorities are not equal either in terms of size, population density, but it doesn't stop us having devolved local government. You know, the islands have got a different um, settlement in terms of how they deal with NHS than other councils do. So I think it's totally legitimate to have slightly different arrangements, but it kind of goes back to the point Nicola made about um, taking back control, that Brexit phrase. There's something about bringing decisions closer to people. And I think more on community empowerment, more on land reform in Scotland, more on um, more powers for local government, that has to be part of the agenda. And I think there's lessons to learn across the UK. Uh, I mean, I've been struck in the last year, I've not gone anywhere, but I have actually had lots of online meetings with equivalent colleagues across the UK. I hadn't done that before the pandemic, but now you can just go on Zoom and you can talk to people in Wales, you can talk to people in London, you can talk to people in Leeds, and it is effortless. So there is something about sharing some of that knowledge. And I think I think it comes back to a point Nicola made. Most of our constituents are not that interested in the detail. If you, if you had a debate in federalism, we would put a lot of people to sleep. Independence and unionism keeps people awake. It's a big argument. But actually, what are the day-to-day -day things about how the health service is coming out of the pandemic? You know, 37,500 ops waited in our region, just in the Lothians alone. It's going to be years before we get the NHS back up and, and the jobs issues, hospitality, tourism. So I think there's a lot of current issues and there's an appetite for change there. And it's enabling people to have the resources at the local level to actually tackle these issues now, not to see them as, oh, we'll have to kick that into touch because it's too difficult. There's something about governments actually changing people's lives now, and there's quite an appetite for that. And I think all of this discussion has to be, how, do, how does making devolution work better um, actually help people now in their lives. And that that's the thing that focuses me. And I, there's a massive appetite in the Labour Party for devolving powers and getting them used and getting them used in our communities and making the difference. And that that's probably where the passion would come in. And, and that's why we've just got to, you know, not endlessly fall out with each other. We are going to have political disagreements, but actually how does it affect our constituents and what can we do now and what needs to change? And that, that I think has got form part of the backdrop to this debate. Thank you. We have a question from Vanessa who's asking you in particular, Sarah, um, as Vice President of the European Movement in Scotland, what your vision for Scotland's EU future is. And I thought I wanted to ask the other panellists what they felt is we've seen in uh, since the Brexit referendum, uh, the desire for membership of the EU in Scotland as a as a, a, a powerful argument for some people for independence. Um, is there any middle way on that? Does the constitutional change offer any kind of answer to people who feel as part of their um, core political beliefs that they should be EU citizens? Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, five years on and we're still seeing what a disaster it was leaving the EU. Um, we're actually seeing the detail of how disastrous it is. So I think our priority has got to be to try and keep the discussions going between Scotland, the rest of the UK and European parliamentarians and states, um, because it, it's been really, I think everybody, well, lots of people warned about the detail and lots of people warned about it's not good to fall out with your nearest neighbours. And I think the impact of Brexit has shown that um, in spades. I think for me, keeping relationships going so that you can do that at a parliamentary level. I mentioned that's one of the things we've committed to doing in our first meeting of the um, committee that deals with Europe in the Scottish Parliament. I think there's issues like Erasmus. What happens next with Erasmus? Uh, you've got the Turing scheme, which is a much more limited approach. I'm speaking to somebody in higher education. Ironically, for some students, it might work because it's only a month. Um, but in terms of a proper relationship, um, keeping Erasmus going, thinking about how the Scottish Government might fund 
um, links between our um, higher educational institutions in Scotland, our universities, and also funding them properly, because that's a key issue. And then there's the kind of um, keeping Europe on our agenda. And there's something, I think, about Scotland's soft power, about where we want to intervene in human rights issues, where we've got a voice that we want to be heard. I think keeping those relationships going with the, the European Union and, and maybe even less with the European Union, but the states that make up the European Union. Um, I think that's got to be on our agenda. And, you know, it took us quite a while to get into the EU. You made a comment, Stephen, about we joined quite late. Well, we joined and it was important to us at that point. Um, and maybe one of the lessons is not being engaged enough all the way throughout that, not being good enough at diplomacy, not being good enough at identifying um, people you could work with. I mean, I look across Europe now and there's a lot of governments I really wouldn't want to have because uh, I don't agree with them politically, but it doesn't mean I wouldn't want to work with them. And having those relationships economically, socially and globally in terms of global politics, I think is crucial. Does uh, uh, constitutional change offer anything to people who, who yearn to be EU citizens again? Well, I don't, um, as I think I said, I'm a passionate Remainer and I will, to my dying day, um, regret and, uh, the decision and, uh, um, and, and will never reconcile myself to it. And I think not so much of myself, but of my grandchildren, you know, we have shrunk their options in a way that I think is indefensible. Um, what do we do about it now? Um, um, I, 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 essentially, I've got, in, a way, in one way, not a lot to add to what Sarah said, because I think bridge building in all sorts of ways at all sorts of levels um, um, is crucial now. Um, and indeed, at the, at the UK level, we have to get past the kind of very fractious megaphone diplomacy that's been going on. Um, we, have to, we have to get a sensible settlement on the Northern Ireland Protocol. My, my sense is that, um, willingly or not, we're kind of inching towards that a more sensible settlement on the protocol. Um, more generally, though, we have to get to a point where we are a, a, a good partner of the EU on all of those common challenges that we face with other Europeans, which we face by facts of geography and of history, of climate change, um, of geopolitics. Um, uh, we, we will discover uh, as, as a nation, what we've had to discover in the past is that you can't not be engaged in the affairs of Europe. Um, we, we've learned this at various points in British history, as we all know. Um, and, and where we are now, I don't think it's possible in the near term to reverse the decision. Um, and indeed, it, it must be said that the EU itself has behaved so badly um, uh, over the winter months that these have probably converted a lot of um, Remainers uh, uh, in, in, in this country into um, people who would never vote to rejoin. And, and that's a shame. It, it, the, the, the state of affairs now is, is kind of almost as worse, as bad as it could conceivably be. And it's got to get better than that. Um, and we've got to do better um, actually than the Swiss. So, somehow that fractious, complicated relationship the Swiss have, we need to say we can do better than that. Uh, and that is a kind of five to 10 year project on the behalf of the Brits. Um, and we need to work at it. And uh, as Sarah said, this is about all sorts of things, including Erasmus and um, uh, um, educational, uh, cultural, all sorts of contacts that remain critically important to a real relationship. Nicola, did you have thoughts on the... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if we think back to 2014 and the, the difference between independence late, as we sometimes talked about it then, or a maximal form of devolution was really quite slim. So there was a lot of commonality or potentially a lot of commonality between these things. But the one thing that is distinctive, that makes them distinctive, is about representation within the European Union. And Brexit, I think, has reinforced that. I agree with a lot of what Sarah said. There are lots of things that can be done in terms of relationships and networking. Um, Scotland, as a devolved territory, was not at the heart of decision making in the EU anyway, except as represented by the UK government so already had to do a lot of that networking um, and I think actually you probably want to do that even more uh, now that the UK is outside of the EU and I think the UK itself is finding 
uh, the UK government itself is finding um, that it has to do that, not just with EU member states, but actually in Brussels, uh, where decisions are made, because there is no doubt that the UK will continue to be affected by EU decision making processes. Um, of course, there is another constitutional reform um, that could help all of that, and that's if a political party campaign to rejoin. Um, it's or, or campaign for a different form of Brexit. We're talking about the spectrum of options around devolution or constitutional reform for Scotland. There is an awful big spectrum of options for what Brexit could mean, and it doesn't have to be uh, the hard Brexit that we ended up with um, last year. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, a lot of questions coming in and the time is flying by, so perhaps if we can try and give our punchy possible answers. Uh, an interesting question from uh, Nelly, uh, who directs it at uh, Nicola, but I think is will be of interest to other, other panel members too, talking about the plurinational nature of the UK might be a problem when it comes to representing the nations in a federal upper house, uh, saying that Belgium, this seems to work fine. So. I suppose, Nicola, what, what, what's the problem? And, and Stephen, how would you fix it? Well, it's a great question, Nelly. I think there is an awful lot of things that we can learn uh, from Belgium about not just the Senate, but intergovernmental relations, about representation internationally. Um, the difference with the UK is the degree of asymmetry um, between the size of the relevant, uh, of the constituent territory. So if you imagine that we uh, devised a, a Senate um, of the nations, let's say, or even the nations and the regions, which um, built into the representation um, an enhanced voice for Scotland and Wales, much bigger than their population share, to reflect the fact that they are nations, then that might not go down terribly well um, in the largest territory of the UK, if it's seen as giving too big a voice more than its fair share uh, to Scotland and to Wales because of the size of population. So I think it's the population asymmetries within the UK um, that make that particularly challenging. Not impossible, not impossible to devise a system, but even if we can devise a system, and I think that we can, I don't think that in and of itself is going to uh, draw a line under debates over Scotland's constitutional future. And, and, and I think the answer has to be that it's nations and regions. You, you could not have a, a sensible um, upper house that is simply a house of the nations for the reasons that Nicola has just uh, spelled out. Um, you need to have a, a diverse representation. Um, we set out some ways of doing that and I, and, I, and, I, and I actually think it would be extremely healthy for the country. I don't think it's, a, I, I'm with Nelly uh, by implication, I think it's extremely healthy. Um, it will of course occasionally produce arguments and, and indeed even, even we've already very recently seen famously an argument between the Scottish Government and uh, the Manchester Mayor. Um, that sort of thing is, is the stuff of ordinary federal life. There were plenty of arguments and, and disputes that, that bubble over into the public domain. But, the, but, but an upper house that is the nations and the regions carefully constructed, and uh, uh, I don't want to go into too much detail of, of the, what we set out in our little book, um, I do think would have a hugely beneficial impact on the way the union functions. I should mention there's a question uh, from Beltran who says perhaps it's offensive to equate uh, Scotland and Wales with English regions rather than uh, as equals of the English Parliament. Very briefly, did you have a thought on that? Uh, you want me to comment on that? Oh. Oh, yes, yeah, so you're, you're suggesting that the uh, uh, House of Lords could work uh, as a, a, a including English regions alongside the devolved nations, but uh, Beltran is suggesting that might be offensive to. to well, I, I, I would I would hope not. I, I just think I mean, what can one say? You know, there are 55 million people living in England, uh, and you kind of have to recognise the reality of that fact. Um, um, but I think this could be done in a way that uh, that, that is a genuine uh, a genuine federal upper house with with some quite strong powers, as I mentioned in my opening remarks. I mean, this is not just a talking shop, um, um, and. Uh, um, I mean, who knows? It's it, 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 the result, whether there would be a case for, in addition to that, a council of nations or something, which would be a completely new creation. Um, but but I don't know. I'd have to think about that. But I, I really don't. 
I really think the upper house the uh, has a core role to play and it does need to be kind of nations and regions um, for all of the obvious reasons. Sarah, did you want to add I, to that? Sorry. Can I come in on that mirror? Or... Yeah, so uh, Nicola first and then Sarah. Sorry. I mean, I think in a way I agree that it would have to be a house of nations and regions, but that's precisely why it's not going to resolve the issue of Scotland's constitutional future because Scotland as a nation or Wales as a nation for that matter would always be um, or, or could always be theoretically outvoted in that context because of the relative size. A, a council of the nations that Stephen talked about, it's not, not a wholly new invention because we have joint ministerial committees, they're not particularly effective, there are proposals for something else, uh, but that kind of intergovernmental forum would I think have to go alongside reforms in the central institutions of power in order to be able to accommodate the, the plurinational national character of the UK, the different um, the, the status, the authority, the legitimacy of those different institutions representing the different territories of the UK. Of course, that raises issues about how England is represented within that. But, you know, there are, there are some ideas for resolving that too. Yeah, and I think they are definitely worth looking at. I'd very much agree with Nicola on that. Um, and I think we can we can get too obsessed about size, because if you think about Scotland, our local authorities, we've got three island authorities who are tiny by comparison with the rest of our local authorities, but they shouldn't be treated with any less respect. And the fact that they are distant from Edinburgh, if, if we were to have this conversation um, in Orkney or Shetland, the dynamic would be utterly different. And I've done meetings up there where um, colleagues who are absolutely not in my party um, are furious at what they see as everything run by Edinburgh. So there's something about perspective. And I think that the bit that's missing is the capacity for people who are currently excluded to actually get to the centre. And part of what we need to do in terms of reforming the UK state is decentralising it. And it's, it's for people at the centre to realise that um, it's not, it's not going to work forever because people are so unhappy about the way power is exercised. So there has, I think that's why we need to push for this. And it's local authorities, it's um, Scotland not being included in the Brexit, Brexit discussions. Um, I mean, I remember as a minister demanding to get to a transport meeting in Brussels. And I was told, well, you don't get to that because you don't need to be there. We're covering that. And I went, there is an issue. We've got the CalMac ferries. And I'm being told that under state aids, we can't keep running CalMac, that is not acceptable. So there's something about having different places where the devolved nations are actually at the top table and it's partly about relationships with ministers. The other thing I'm focused on is parliament, parliament as well, holding governments to account and asking those tough questions. Um, and that needs to be done in the UK parliament as much as the Scottish parliament. And for me, the Andy Burnham rule the other week about Manchester was illustrative. But his, his contribution last summer, um, when he stood on the front of the, uh, the town hall and demanded proper money from Boris Johnson, that was a game changer up here as well, because our local authorities looked at that and our finance minister looked at that. And suddenly there was action because our councils had waited weeks for consequentials money and they were told, well, you'll have to tell me how you're spending it before I release it. There is something about governments hang on to power. And I think... We're in a world where we have to make people work together because otherwise the conflict we've seen post Brexit is just it's not good for our constituents. It's not good for the UK and, and it's not it's not how democracy should work. We should do better than that. Thank you. Now our time has got away. There's only a few minutes left. I see uh, Bill in the questions um, uh, is quoting Jonathan Sumption as arguing that uh, uh, drafting a written constitution would raise fundamental issues, which the electorate is simply ill-equipped to get its head around. And he asks um, uh, how long it will take to create a better informed electorate. Well, I, I hope this event um, has, has done something. At least uh, this particular member of the electorate feels a wee bit better informed. But I wonder finally, and with apologies to all the audience members who asked questions, if I could ask each of our panelists to offer a very brief final thought. Stati, shall we do in reverse, reverse order? So Nicola, you go first. Um, 
Um, so I, I think actually what, some of the things that Sarah was talking about there are interesting, making me think that a lot of the debates that I study, which is a, a lot to do with the way that the devolved governments engage with the UK government, the frustrations uh, that they have, and Sarah illustrated uh, an example that she had experienced there. There's been a lot more of that lately as well in the context of Brexit. There's a lot of frustration about the, the recognition and the authority that the devolved governments um, demand and don't seem to get um, in the relationship with the UK government. And actually, I think the light can be shone within Scotland in that respect too. So a lot of the dynamics in that relationship between the Scottish government and the UK government, we can see in some of the dynamics in the relationships between local government and the Scottish government too. So I think it's seeing it in the round um, and all of the challenges. I don't think local government decentralization is a quick fix for anything either, uh, but a lot of the challenges um, that are experienced at one level are replicated at the other. Thank you. Stephen, did you have a final thought? Um, on, only that um, I think this does require extensive uh, nationwide debate involving civic society just very generally. It needs to be orchestrated. I would like to see governments um, uh, facilitating, encouraging, calling for that. Um, this clearly can't be a small group of experts um, um, bringing down from the mountains some tablets of stone on how the constitution should work better. Um, it is detailed technical stuff. Um, Sarah's absolutely right that the, 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 the key thing is to get more local power, local influence, um, local voices getting heard, and not to have central government, whether that's London or Edinburgh, I guess, um, determining what's best for what's best for people. So an, a real extension of democracy. Um, this would make the country work better. It's not merely good because it is good as a, as a democratic principle. It will also make the country work better. Thank you. And Sarah? Yeah, and I think this is this issue is not going to go away. Um, and it's our opportunity. It's I kind of feel where I am, it's our responsibility to keep pushing on the status quo we have. Um, and people people deserve better. So I think as politicians and as people who've got an influence, we need to keep pushing for change. And it does not all ha have to happen overnight. Um, but I think people expect to see change. And I think there's a challenge for both the UK and the Scottish government, because sometimes it suits each to fall out with each other. But on things like social security, immigration issues, uh, devolving employment issues, there are some real wins for both if they could just actually sit down and let us all get on with it. And I think the local government aspect never actually, it never hits the headlines in the same way as the Scotland rest the UK issue does. And it's been interesting to me to watch the mayor's issue. And that's kind of interesting in terms of how that's really, you know, the, the role of Sadiq Khan. Um, and there's quite an interesting range of politics of the mayors as well now in England. So I think that there's a momentum building up there. And I think we need to be thinking in Scotland how we devolve to local authorities and communities, but also that inter intergovernmental state issues. I think the changes that are needed in the UK state are needed urgently. And some of those changes would not require to rewrite the constitution. Some of them actually just need people to sit and say, we should do better. People are expecting us to do better. And, and it partly, for, for me, Brexit is a warning because um, I was just looking at how close the referendum was before I came on the call. I'd forgotten how close it was because it felt like, you know, the leave was just walked it. You know, 30% of Scots voted to leave. So there's something about, there's a huge lesson for us to actually get on and make some of these changes um, because people's lives depend on it. And one of the opportunities for us is COP26 coming up this year. That is a really interesting opportunity to see how the UK works intergovernmentally, cross-government, and it's an opportunity for Scotland to use its soft power to reach out to some of the other nations and actually have some good dialogue that can continue beyond it. And more of these kind of discussions, not necessarily me, but it's good, it's good having this kind of mix because people like us don't normally talk to each other. And I think it, it's good to make you think about stuff that isn't on your agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, now we've run over our time for which uh, I apologize as uh, moderator.
there's certainly a lot of very weighty topics we've touched on, and I think we've seen both the challenges and some of the possibilities of constitutional reform. So I will certainly uh, be interested in seeing future such events along these lines. But uh, for now, thank you very much to our panelists and uh, goodbye from me.